Well, this is week number six, a series I'm teaching called Living from Christ Within. We're going to talk about being built up in our spirit, man, and being led by the Holy Spirit. We're a three-part being. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. This is an awesome promise of what God will do in everyone who trusts Christ. If we trust him, he'll sanctify us completely. When Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, he said, I've appeared to you for this reason. So that you're going to preach and turn people from darkness to light, from Satan to the kingdom of God, that they'll receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified. That means cleansed, transformed, and set apart among those who are sanctified by faith in me. It's faith in Jesus by which we're sanctified. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Now, he didn't say in the next age, in this life, now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That's a gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 and 31. It's of God's doing that you're in Christ Jesus who became for us. Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. We glory in the Lord who gives us a gift of righteousness when we receive him and trust him. Isaiah 45, 22, God says, look unto me. That means to look unto him is to trust him. Not to look to ourselves. Look unto me, all you ends of the earth, and be saved. For I am God, there is no other. So he's our righteousness and our sanctification. He transforms us. He breaks the power of sin. He imparts the love. He illuminates us. He guides us. He transforms us. He sanctifies us. He sets us apart from evil, from sin, from what's unclean, unto his spirit of holiness. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body. So he, he lists us. We're a three-part being. Now the divine order that the Holy Spirit put this in is spirit, soul, body. Be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's an awesome promise. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Amen. We need to believe that. Amen. We need to believe Jude 24 and 25. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory. Amen. Our faith in God has to go beyond receiving the forgiveness of sins. We need to trust him to cleanse us, transform us, and to keep us. He will. Now, here's what we want to talk about. We are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. God has designed us. He's created us in his image. God is spirit. We have a spirit, soul, and a body. In the beginning, before the fall in the garden, man walked in the spirit as a soul and a body. The spirit is where we be, we're connected with God. First Corinthians says that when we're born again, our spirit is one with God. When you're born again, the reality is Christ Jesus lives inside you by his spirit. He's in there. Let that sink in. That should make anybody encouraged. The Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The spirit of man is not the flame, it's the candle. The Holy Spirit's the flame. So he comes one with our spirit and he lights it up. So now our spirit is one and the light of the world, Christ, comes in. And God, we're told in the epistle to the Corinthians, 
God who spoke into the darkness and created light has shown in our hearts the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. For we have this treasure, the light of Christ, in earthen fleshly vessels. Inside us is the light of the world. <laughs> Inside us is the light of the world. So our spirit is one with his. And the way God intended us to walk were to use our brain. We have a soul, a mind, a will, and emotion. We have a body that picks up sense from the physical realm. But our spirit man has all the senses that our physical body does. Our spirit man has eyes. Our spirit man can see and taste and feel and hear. So when man walked with God in the beginning, he walked led by the Spirit with a soul and a body that touched the natural world. But the Spirit man ruled. Now the fall was, man was enticed and lied to by the devil. He was enticed by the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh. He saw the fruit. Lust of the eyes, it looked good. Thought it would taste the flesh. Pride, I'll be like God. So the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, lust, and man used human reasoning and his flesh desires and the soul ex exalted himself against the spirit man who was in agreement with God. And so the spirit was overthrown and the flesh and the soul took over. And that's sin, that was the fall of man. At that moment, the spirit of man died, broke off communication with God. And now man was a walking dead man with a soul and a body and a dead spirit. God said the day that you eat of it, you're going to die. When our spirit loses communication, it's disconnected from God. It's only a matter of time until your body dies. And the soul died. The soul became very sick. Before, the spirit was one with God, and the spirit had ascendancy. The spirit man, who was one in agreement with the spirit of God, ruled the man. But now the spirit fell, the soul and flesh ruled. Salvation is a reversal of that. When we're born again, the spirit of God comes in, and our spirit Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, you who were once dead in trespasses, God has made alive by his goodness and his kindness and made us sit together with Christ in the heavenlies. So now our spirit man's born again. But what our spirit man has to do is overthrow our soul and our flesh and take back the rule. That's what has to happen. Now, when our spirit is born again and we're ruled by our soul, that's our, that can be our human reasonings. You know, well, I don't think that makes sense. But your spirit is telling you yes, and your soul is going, I don't see how in the world that could work. So if our soul dominates, the kingdom of God doesn't manifest because the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, Jesus said, don't say, look over there or look over there. He said, the kingdom's inside. Yeah. The kingdom is the rule and reign of Christ who's one with our spirit. So walking, living out of Christ is learning how to be sensitive to our spirit and cause our spirit man to rise up and overthrow our soul, put the soul in subjection to the spirit man. That's what the kingdom is. Where the kingdom is where the king rules. So we're going to talk about how to strengthen our spirit man. Build up our spirit man. If you spend more time or I spend more time feeding your soul according to the course of the world or according to human reasonings, your soul will become stronger than your spirit. And if you don't feed your spirit, your spirit will be too weak to throw your soul over. Our, throw, our soul needs to be dethroned. Amen. 
But when we walk in the Spirit, the Spirit puts to death the deeds of the flesh. Because that's what the Bible says. If you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, the flesh can't put the flesh to death. Trying harder can't put the flesh to death. But walking in the Spirit, the Spirit overthrows the flesh. We want to talk about that. Here's what Romans 8 verse 5 says. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So one of the first things to make our spirit man strong is watch out what you think about. You have to think. Our minds have to be renewed to the Word of God. We have to put a filter of the love of God over our heart. Proverbs says, guard your heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. So whatever we think about, we become. So we have this treasure in the earthen vessels, but we have to think those that walk Here's what it says, Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So thinking about Jesus, what he did for us, who he is in us, who we are in him, thinking about that will cause us to walk in the Spirit. But if we look at the world and we think of the world's values, we look at the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16. He said, the things that are highly esteemed by men are an abomination to God. Everything the world exalts, you got to have this kind of a look. You got to drive this kind of a car. You got to have this whatever. Everything the world says is valuable and great. God said, I despise it. God values things that the world doesn't value. He values Jesus. He values the life of Christ in us. Yielding to the Holy Spirit, walking in purity, walking in love is far more valuable and precious and impressive to God than all the world has to offer. Helping someone who can't repay you when no one's looking is valuable to God. See? The things of the kingdom. He, Jesus said the things that are highly esteemed by men are abomination to God. God's not impressed by talent. He's not impressed by how good someone is at sports. That came from God. He's not impressed by how good we can sing or do anything. Here's what God's impressed by. When Jesus went to be baptized in the Jordan River. God was so proud of me, couldn't hold himself back. He opened the heavens and leaned out and said audibly, That's my son in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in us and we have the ability by the grace of God to yield to him and allow his spirit to conform us to him the greatest thing that could ever happen in our life is to know him and be conformed to him and abide in him so that he can manifest so when we think about the things of the spirit we walk in the spirit Romans 8, 14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The word sons is weos. It means fully mature. They're given the rights, the authority, the power. It means they get the checkbook and the keys. Who, who gets that? Who gets that? They that are led by the Spirit. So we have one thing to do in this life. We need to learn how to Listen to, discern, and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as we do, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Now thanks be to God who always, everyone say always. Always, always means always. 
Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. That means, now please think about this. That means there is no situation we can get in that God doesn't have a way of victory. There's no situation we can be in that God doesn't have an answer. And that answer is to lead us into victory. So lead to be, to, to, for him to lead us into victory, we've got to follow. So our whole walk with God, our whole purpose in this life is learning to be sensitive and aware to the Holy Spirit and be led by him because he's in our spirit and, and to feed our spirit and to strengthen our spirit. Our spirit man can become weak if he's neglected, if he's not fed. So we're going to talk today about how to build up the spirit man. You feed the spirit man, starve the flesh. God will always lead us in triumph. Now the spirit doesn't always make sense to the soul. That's why the soul can't be in charge. Now God will use our soul. I'm talking about our our mind, our will, our emotions, human reasonings. God uses that, but it has to be confirmed by the witness of the spirit. We have to be aware that when we're using our reasoning, but our spirit is giving us a check, we need to put our soul down and follow the spirit. Let me give you an example. It's all through the Bible. All through the Bible. In 1 Kings chapter 17, there was a famine in the land. Elijah is the one that prayed it in. He prophesied it. He said, at my word, there will be no rain. And there was no rain. There was famine. Everything was dried up. And God had the prophet by a brook. And the fowls of the air were bringing him meat. So he was drinking and eating while other people were in famine. Then the brook dried up. And then the word of the Lord came to him. Now, this doesn't make sense. But we have to be led by the Spirit. I'm giving us an example of uh, we have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, no matter what it looks like in the natural. God said, I've prepared a widow for you to provide for you. He was led by the Spirit to the widow. When he got there, guess what she was doing? She had her last cup of flour and her last little bit of oil and she was mixing it together to make her last cake for her and her son, and they were going to eat it and then die. That was their plan. They're going to eat it and die. Now, how many of us, if we walked by our human reasonings and we said, Lord, I'm hungry, where should I go? If we looked and we said, there's a widow over there. She's about to make her last cake. Go take it from her and eat it. See, human reasoning, doesn't, it doesn't work. Where will I go for provision? Lord, hey, they can't help me. They're about to die. God said, here's the word of the Lord. That's why we have to be led by our spirit. Go over there. So he went over there and he obeyed her by the spirit. How many know that's not easy? It's not easy. You can't have the fear of man and be led by the spirit. You know how hard it would be to tell a widow, give me your last meal. Come on. Everything in you would scream in your own soul, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. That can't be God. It can't be God. It was God. He said, do it. Guess what? Thank God she was led by the Spirit. She obeyed. She made it and said, here it is, man of God. And when she gave it to him, God multiplied it and multiplied it and multiplied it. And all during the famine, they all had food. So that's an example of the Spirit ruling over the soul. See, if we're going to walk in the supernatural, and we must, we're at the end of the age. By the way, for those that don't believe that, I've heard the argument. Everybody's thought we were in the last days for the last 2,000. Listen, Lord willing, someday I'll, I'm going to bring a message and show you. There's never been a generation like this one. Never. Israel's been reborn as a nation. That in itself is such a huge, huge miracle. 
That's never happened in human history before. Where a nation was scattered 2,000 years ago, they kept their culture, their language. The original language has been recovered. They recover their land supernaturally. God said he would do this. Once Israel was reborn in 1948, the clock started ticking. Amen. We're in the last days. Amen. But anyway, that's for another time. And by the way, the things our president has done has been fulfilling prophecy, making peace between Arab nations and Israel. Amen. Because the Bible talks about certain nations will be uh, allies with Israel when they're attacked by Russia. It's in the Bible. What's happening right now is fulfilling biblical prophecy. Amen. But anyway, in these last days, we have to rise up and walk in the Spirit, in Christ, led by the Spirit, where our, our spirit man rules over our soul and our flesh. Here's another example. Elisha, the prophet. He was with the sons of the prophets prophets, and they had a borrowed axe, and they were cutting down trees. They were going to build a place for the prophets. And one of the young prophets came to Elisha, and he said, Master, alas, he said, the axe head came off and went into the water. How many know iron doesn't float? And he said, it was a borrowed axe. Now, Elisha's led by the Spirit. There's one thing we're going to learn. If we're going to move in the supernatural the soul can't figure it out. The soul, human reasoning is against the supernatural. So Elisha's a prophet. He's led by the Spirit. He said, show me where it went in the water. He said, right over there. The prophet got a stick, cut it, and he threw it in the water where it was, and the iron axe head floated up. He said, now grab the axe head. And he grabbed it. How many know that doesn't make any sense? You understand that? There's a reason I'm saying these things. God's about to move in signs and wonders and miracles and power. And he's going to move through people that are led by the Spirit. It doesn't make sense to spit and make mud and put it on someone's eyes. And they open up. You can try it right now and it won't work. But when the Spirit's moving, you will do it. If you try it now, they're just going to get mad at you. <laughs> so what are we saying? The primary thing we need to do is, is recognize this. Christ lives in us. Our spirit is one with Him. With, with everything in us, we must feed our spirit man and cultivate sensitivity to the Spirit so our spirit man can have the ascendancy and rule. So let me just again take a few minutes. This won't take long, but I want to remind us once again. Romans 16, verse 25. Now unto him who's able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. So Paul said, you will be established by the preaching of the mystery that's been kept secret since the world began. What is that mystery? Colossians 1, 27 tells us it's Christ in you. So we're going to be established by remembering Christ lives in us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are new. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Please let me say this. Give me three or four minutes to say it. You need to hear it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. You have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing. It's yours in Christ in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. You have been raised up. You who are dead in trespasses. You've been made alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And you've been raised up together and made sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. This speaks of the gift of righteousness given to you. You're there. Colossians says, you are, not will be, you are complete in him. Amen. Doesn't mean our souls are totally transformed yet, but it's in God's economy, when he says that it, it's as good as done. 1 Corinthians 1.30, I quoted earlier, Jesus has been made for us 
wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. We have to remember those things. We're new. Christ is in us. We're seated with him. We have everything. Second Peter says, God has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, if it's ours in Christ, that means whatever situation we're in, we don't need to panic, no stress. We just say, Lord, whatever I need right now is mine. Whatever I need right now is mine. So now the question isn't, oh my God, are you going to meet my needs or show me? No, that's not. The question is now, Lord, you've already given me everything. I just need to be led by you. So Lord, what step do I take? Who do I talk to? Who do I not talk to? Just show me what to do, Lord, because it's already all mine in Christ. We have to understand that. God's provided everything to life. That's the natural realm. And godliness, that's the spiritual realm. Everything. God's a good, good father. So 1 John 4, 9 says, This is the love of God manifested toward us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Philippians 1, 21, For me to live is Christ. And last week we talked out of 2 Corinthians 3, 5, the apostle said, Not that we are sufficient to think of anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Okay? Now that's our introduction to what I want us to talk about today. To live out of Christ. We, we talked about believing the word. And, and as you receive Christ, Colossians 2, so walk in him. We receive him by faith. We walk in him by faith. I believe, therefore I spoke. We, we believe the word of God. And as we go through our day, we speak it. Now, if you look at the life of Christ, he was always speaking where he came from, what he was doing, and where he's going. He was always a man of faith speaking it. He knew his purpose, he knew his destiny, and he was always saying it. He said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He spoke it. He said, I'm not alone. The Father's always with me. He spoke it, for I always do what pleases him. He said, I'm going back to the Father. He was always speaking. He said, it's not me that does the works. The Father in me does it. What if we start talking like Jesus? I've been sent to this earth for a work. You've been sent here for a work. You've been sent here to make an impact. Yes, you have. There is nobody in the body of Christ who doesn't have a significant calling and impact. I've been sent from heaven. Say it. I've been sent from heaven <laughs> to do the will of the Father. Psalm 139 says, all my days were written in a book before there were any of them. Ephesians 2.10 says, God has good works. I've been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has foreordained that I should walk in them. Nobody else can do my work and I'm not doing anybody else's work. I'm doing the one God's assigned me. That's it. See? Now we're a three-part being. And I want to talk to us how to build up our inner man. You probably heard this verse, but we're going to look at it again. Jude 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith... Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, I'm going to break that down and go over it little bit by bit. You beloved. Okay, that's the first thing. Beloved means you are loved. <laughs> that's, that's it. Hey, you, you, your beloved. <laughs> your mind can't even figure it out. Why could he love? How could he love? He can't 
He can't not love you. It's his nature. He, he can't. God can't not love you. He loves you. He loves you because he is love. Because he made you. And he knew, God knew before he made you. He knew all the mistakes, blunders, and sins we would make. And it didn't, it didn't make him nervous at all. He made us anyway and said, I got him covered. Because the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. So you're loved by God. Number one, you're loved. He said, build yourself up on your most holy faith. Now, I want to tell you that Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. One of the primary ways to build up our faith is to read the Bible and meditate on the word. It's crucial. If you're not, if you and I are not spending enough time in the word, we're starving our spirit man. The spirit man cannot take ascendancy, overthrow the soul, and rule. The spirit is where Christ is. So that's the kingdom. The kingdom is Christ in your spirit, overthrows your soul, and he starts ruling. It cannot happen if we starve our spirit man by neglecting the word. The word of God is alive. Jesus said that. It's also in the, he said in John chapter 6, the, the words I speak are spirit and life. Hebrews said it's a living word, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it will pierce, and it'll divide between soul and spirit. Psalm 119 verse 130 says, the entrance of his word, the living word of God, when we read it and hold it in our heart, it penetrates and it separates between our soul and our spirit. And it feeds our spirit and it renews our soul. So to be built up in our faith, we have to be people of the word. Jesus said it very plainly. Whoever keeps my word is the one that loves me. And I will love him. And I will manifest myself. Because I want to see Jesus. Read the Bible a lot. Meditate on it. Okay? So he said, build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, praying in the Holy Spirit includes speaking in tongues, and that's what I want to talk about. Now, praying in the Spirit means being in the Spirit. I can pray in English and be, and be praying in the Spirit. But one of the primary ways, and the, one of the quickest and most effective and efficient ways to get in the Spirit is praying in tongues. So praying in the Spirit includes praying in tongues, but it's not limited to that. So he said, build yourself in your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit. And then he said, keep yourselves in the love of God. He's telling us how to be built up. Our inner man starts with, I'm beloved. I'm loved by God. I'm going to keep my faith strong by being in the Word. I'm going to pray in tongues a lot. Paul said, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than all of you. I pray in the Spirit. And then I'm going to keep myself in the love of God. God is love, 1 John 4, 16. If we abide in love, we abide in God. Now, I can be in the Word and in prayer, but if I violate and I go outside of love, I get out of the Spirit. So it takes all of them. I've got to keep the Word in me, and it's the Word in me will keep me in love. I keep the word, I need to pray in the Holy Spirit and then keep myself in the love of God. That's the biggest thing. When we open our mouth and say things or repeat things, we should, or we have attitudes or we get angry or we hold a... All that stuff of the flesh gets us out of Christ. Christ is still in us, but we're not abiding in him. Okay? We're still born again, but we're not abiding in him. So staying in the love of God keeps us in the Spirit. Then he said, looking for, now I looked up the word in the Greek. The word looking for is translated a number of times in the Bible as receiving. In other words, uh, it was translated like this. Paul wrote in an epistle, so-and-so is coming, receive her when she comes. So they would say, look for her. But it really means, the word means to receive. 
It's better than looking for. We're not looking for eternal life. He said, now, now when it says eternal life here, it's not talking about getting saved. They're already saved. Eternal speaks of the quality, the endless quality of the life of the Spirit. Paul even wrote to Timothy, lay hold on eternal life. Well, he was already born again. He didn't mean get saved. He meant build your spirit man up, walk in the Spirit so that you're laying hold on the life of God, on the life of God. So let's read it like this. You who are loved by God, your beloved, build yourself up in your faith, praying in tongues. Keep yourself in the love of God and receive the life of God that's in Jesus Christ. Okay? So the way we build up our inner man, we remember, I'm beloved. I, I stay in the word. I pray in tongues and pray in the spirit a lot. I keep myself within the parameters of the love of God. And, and while I'm doing those things, I'm receiving the life of God is filling me. The life of God is filling me. So, okay, are you there? Now, I want to talk to us about tongues for the next few minutes. Don't check out on me because all of that was intro for this. This is very, very important. Speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, singing in tongues is so important that if that's not happening in your life, you, it needs to change. You need to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And I, at the end of the message, if I get that far, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. And, and practice daily, all the time, praying in tongues. So can I talk to you about it for a little bit? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If you have your Bible, you can follow along. Verse 1. It says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. Now before I read this, I want to bring some clarification. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 tells us that there are a variety of tongues. There's not just the tongues that's a mystery to God. There is a tongue that's speaking mysteries to you and God. It's intercessory prayer. There's a tongue that is a prophecy that must be interpreted. It's another kind of tongue. There's a speaking and singing in tongues that's magnifying God. It's another kind of tongue. And then there's another kind of tongue. These are all in the Bible. That is a, a known human language. Happened on the day of Pentecost. They spoke in tongues, and the people heard them in their own language. So there's a variety of tongues. Now, when Paul talks about tongues, he, said, I, he must be assuming that they know all that because he goes back and forth in this chapter speaking about the different kinds of tongues. There's one tongue that needs to be interpreted. That tongue is a sign for unbelievers. The unbelievers or the tongue that's another language, that's a sign for unbelievers. I've had that happen to me. Years ago, Melinda and I were at a conference on the East Coast in uh, South Carolina. And I was, uh, after one of the sessions, I was sitting in a back green room with the host of the conference, Kingsley Fletcher. And he's from Ghana, Africa. And two of his friends from Ghana, Africa walked in the room. Now, when uh, first I was speaking with Dr. Fletcher, the two of us, in English. It was right after the meeting. And... Um, how many know after a meeting, you can just be full of the Holy Spirit? And um, so we're sitting there talking. The door opens up. Two of his friends walk in the room from Ghana, Africa. They sit down. And then the three of them start talking. So I just sat there. And they're speaking in their language. It's called Chui. It's, it's T-W-I, but it's pronounced Chui. So I don't know their language. And they're speaking in that language. So I felt a little bit left out. And uh, as they kept on speaking in that language, I felt a little bit bugged. I'm thinking, hey, I was talking to him before you guys walked in. <laughs> and um, I wasn't really, nothing serious. It wasn't anything serious. I wasn't in the flesh yet. I was still in the spirit. <laughs> I was in the spirit. I felt, I was filled with Holy Spirit. And out of, you know, when you get full of the Holy Spirit, things will come out of you that will surprise you. 
When my uh, youngest daughter gave birth to her, her daughter, I went over to the hospital right after the prayer meeting. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, I was full of the Holy Spirit when I left here. I just been praying for an hour before the prayer meeting, an hour and a half during the prayer, you know. I was full of the Holy Spirit. Went over to the hospital. She just gave birth to the baby. I'm just sitting in a chair. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, things will come out of your mouth that will shock you. They said, we're going to weigh the baby. I said, it's seven pounds, 13 ounces. I couldn't believe I said that. They weighed it. They said, she's seven, 13. They said, now we're going to measure. I said, it's 19 and a half inches. They measured it, said 19 and a half inches. See why we need to be full of the Holy Spirit. And then an, an hour later, it sort of dissipates and you're back to your normal self. That's what happens. That's why the Bible says we need to be being filled continually. But as I was sitting with those men and they started speaking in the, that language, I interrupted them and I was shocked by what I said. I said, I'm going to speak in tongues and it'll come out your language. I thought, what did I just say? And they all looked at me and I started speaking in tongues and their eyes got big. They said, you just spoke our language. I said, what did I say? They said, they said, the fourth man is here. So that's a sign. It's a sign and a wonder. So there's different kinds of tongues. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke in a known language. Then there's a tongue that's interpreted. It's a tongue that, like you've seen Rachel here. She'll speak in tongues and then she'll interpret and prophesy. It's tongues and interpretation. Then there's a tongue that's unto God that's our prayer language. Then there's a tongue that's singing and magnifying the Lord. So Paul's talking about tongues. 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Now that's one kind of tongue, because another kind of tongue is speaking to men. You understand what I'm saying? So he's talking about the kind of tongue that's directly to God where we speak mysteries. For no one understands us forever. In this, however, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Now, if you write in your Bible, you should underline that. He who speaks in a tongue edify. The word edify means build up. It strengthens and builds up your spirit man. He that speaks in tongue builds up his inner man. He who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues. Now all can, but all don't. But all can. For him to say, I wish you all spoke with tongues means all can. Okay? But even more that you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in a tongue, unless he indeed interprets that the church may receive edification. So if I stood up here and just spoke in tongues, nobody's going to get edified unless I interpret it. That's what he's saying. So he says, it's better at a church to prophesy. Everybody can hear it and get built up. But if you're going to speak in tongues, interpret it. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? You still talk about interpreting it. For even things without life, whether a flute or a harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what's piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you'll be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I don't know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So what he's saying is, if we want gifts of the Spirit, let our motive be to build up the body. But everybody should pray in tongues to build up yourself. That's what he's saying. So gifts are not to, to make us look good or to, build, uh, uh, to draw attention to us. They're to build the body up. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Are you following with me? Okay, 
So now he's saying, I wish you all spoke in tongues. That's the word of God. It's God saying to you, I wish you all spoke in tongues. Why? Because he that prays in a tongue builds up himself. Your spirit man gets strong. Now he said, when you speak in a tongue, pray that you may interpret. Who, do you, who interprets? The one that speaks. Are you following this? Let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So when you're praying in the tongues, your spirit is praying. And your spirit is one with the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit, with your spirit, praying the perfect will of God. The Holy Spirit's not going to pray anything amiss. He's going to pray the perfect will of God. What is the conclusion then? With tongues, and it needs to be interpreted. He said, here's the conclusion. Now, now put it in light of verse 13. Let he that prays in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So when you pray in tongues, pray in tongues. And then ask the Lord. After you pray in tongues, Lord, what are we praying about? And thoughts will come to you. It'll be revelation from the Holy Spirit in your spirit. He'll impart to you the interpretation of what you're praying. You can pray it in English. So he said, this is the conclusion. I will pray with the Spirit. I will. That means you can will to pray in tongues. He calls praying in tongues, praying with the Spirit. I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. How is he going to do that? He said, let him that pray in a tongue, pray that he may interpret. So you pray in tongues for a while. And as you're praying in tongues, be sensitive to your spirit the interpretation to the tongues doesn't come through the mind. It comes through the spirit. It doesn't come from the soul. It comes from the spirit. So as you pray in tongues, you walk the floor, you lay in bed and pray in tongues, then you become sensitive in your spirit. The longer you pray in tongues, the stronger your spirit gets. The longer you pray in tongues, the more sensitive your spirit will get to the Holy Spirit. So as you pray in tongues, then as, you're, as you lean into that, you'll start getting inspirations and thoughts. And there'll be revelations from the Holy Spirit to your spirit. you say, oh, yes, Lord. And you can pray it in English. So Paul said, that's a conclusion. I'm going to pray with the Spirit and with my understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with my understanding. Sometimes we all sing in tongues here. and Sing unto the Lord. If you start singing praises unto God, if you keep doing it, in between will come interpretations. Glory to God, we magnify you, Lord. Holy is your name. So we'll sing in tongues and sing with the understanding. So there's, why? Because we're interpreting the tongues. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen, at your giving of thanks, since he doesn't understand what you say? For indeed you give thanks, but the other is not edified, unless you interpret. Now he says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words with a tongue. Next verse, so I want you, here's where we're, it's, it's going to get exciting. Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however in malice be babes. You know, little kids don't hold grudges. You can see little toddlers play together and fuss, and five minutes later they forgot they were fussing. So he said, in malice, be like little children. Don't hold a grudge. However, uh, don't be babes in understanding, but be mature. Then he says, in the law it is written, and he quotes Isaiah. With men of other tongues and other lips, I'll speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. That's a quote from Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. Paul took that scripture. Everybody stay with me. This is, this is important for us to get. Paul used a scripture from Isaiah, and, in, and by the Holy Spirit, he applied it to speaking in tongues. Right? Now let's go back to... He just quoted it. With men of other tongues and other lips, I'll speak to this people, yet for all that, they'll not hear me. That even happened on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 came to Christ 
But other thousands on the day of Pentecost who heard and saw the sign and the wonder, they didn't come to Christ. There are many, 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 many thousands who heard. Only 3,000 came to Christ. So Isaiah prophesied that. I'm going to even speak in tongues to them. And he said, they still won't listen to me. Now, let's go back and read Isaiah 28. Some did. Verse 11. This is the verse Paul quoted in, in, in interpreted as speaking in tongues. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Anybody get that? Okay. Praying in tongues. If you pray in tongues enough, your spirit will get rest. You'll get refreshed. Paul said that Isaiah was speaking about the gift of tongues. God said, I'm going to speak through stammering lips, other tongues. He said, this is the rest I have for them. This is the refreshing for them. I'm teaching you from the word. This is not my idea. This is the word of God. And God's teaching us how to build up our inner man. How to get rest and refreshing and make our inner man strong. He said, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God receiving the life of Christ. So it means looking unto him means receiving the eternal life that's in Jesus. So praying in tongues edifies us. It builds us up. It brings refreshing and it brings rest. Now this is something uh, Melinda and I practice decades. You're going through the day. We have to learn to be sensitive to our spirit. And sometimes you feel a heaviness. You don't have that lightness. You don't have the joy of the Lord. Sometimes what we need to do is just pray in tongues. And you just pray in tongues and pray in tongues. Sometimes you don't have peace. So you can let go in your room, lay down on your bed and just pray in tongues for 10 or 15 minutes. And guess what will happen? Rest will come. Sometimes I've found you have to pray in tongues for 45 minutes. There's some kind of spiritual battle going on. The devil's trying to do something. We may not even know what's going on, but the Holy Spirit in us knows it. And when there's not a peace or not a rest, pray in tongues. And you pray in tongues and pray in tongues until you get to rest. Now try it, and you'll find it. Not only will you get into rest, once you get to rest, you cross over into a, a place of buoyancy. You get refreshment. And there's times Melinda and I won't even talk to each other I mean, I'll leave, the, I'll leave the house in the morning and for the next six, seven, eight hours, I haven't talked to her. And I'll feel all day, I'll feel a heaviness and I'll just be praying in tongues, praying in tongues, praying in tongues, praying in tongues. And through the day, off and on, and then it might be the afternoon I get breakthrough. I have peace. Later, I'll talk to Melinda, I'll say, man, all day, I had, for hours, I had a burden. I had to pray in tongues. To, she said the same exact thing for me. She'll go through the same thing. So sometimes we'll compare. What were you praying for? Did the Lord show you what it was? Sometimes she'll say, yes, I prayed for this long. And finally I said, Lord, what is it? And then he showed me their faces. Then I was able to pray in English for them. So this is the gift that's in every believer, praying in tongues. We have to use this gift. How arrogant, how presumptuous would it be to say, I don't need that. Come on, we need it. We need to pray in tongues. And, and, and we cultivate it. So we do it without even knowing we're doing it. Without even knowing all day long we're praying in tongues in the shower while we're driving at the red light. Pray in the spirit. Watch your spirit, man, will get built up. It'll bring rest. When you don't have rest, pray in tongues till you do. When you don't have refreshing, pray in tongues till you do. Now it's not the only way. There's other times, sometimes the Holy Spirit may lead you to get down on the floor and groan. He may lead you to praise. But tongues, praying in the Spirit, builds up our spirit man. It's important. I loved hearing what Kevin said. I said, and he had a visitation with the Lord. The Lord said to him, 
He was encouraging him, tell the people to pray in tongues a lot. Psalm 119, verse 136, I'm sorry, verse uh, 16 says, all of your days were written in a book before you were born. Read it in Psalm 139. All of your days, verse 16, were written in God's book before you were born. There's a book in heaven where God has laid out all the good plans he has for you. Here's what the Lord told Kevin Zedai. Now, how many believe that when the Holy Spirit is praying through us in tongues, he's praying the right things? Here's what the Lord told Kevin. He said, tell my people to pray in tongues. When they pray in tongues, they're praying according to the book written in heaven. And he said, when they do, my angels read that book. And they go down and help them bring it to pass. We should be praying in tongues all the time. So we should pray in tongues. I wanted to go farther today, but I'm going to try to stop it here. We should pray in tongues and build up our spirit, man. Let our faith be built up. Let's see what else I have. But you, beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God. Receiving the mercy of the Lord unto the life of Jesus Christ. Mercy means kindness. As we keep in the love of God, praying, building up our faith, we're receiving the kindness of God that fills our spirit man. I'll finish with this verse, 2 Timothy 1.6. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, stir up the gift that was given to you through the laying on of hands. Paul's talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, stir up the gift. Now, if you read it in the Greek, it's, it's interesting to me how the translators came up with the phrase, stir up. It's not even there in the Greek. Do you know what it says in the Greek? Fan the flames of the gift that was given to you. Do you know what that is? Our God, Hebrews 12, is a consuming fire. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, what was it? Fire. So he said, that gift has been given to you. Now, fan the flames. So how much fire we walk in depends on whether we're fanning the flames or not. If we neglect the gift, it becomes a smoldering charcoal. No flame. But if you fan the flames, it makes a little embers turn into a flame. If you keep fanning it, it turns into an inferno. We keep doing it, we become covered with fire. Stir up the gift. So let me conclude with this. This praying in tongues is one of the primary ways, not the only way, it's one of the primary ways to build up our spirit man. And the stronger your spirit man becomes, it's easier it is to overthrow the soul, the carnal thoughts, easier it is to walk in the supernatural. I'll say this, speaking in tongues is the gateway to all the other gifts. It'll bring you in. That and walking in the love of God. Because God is love. So we're talking about building up our spirit man so we can live out of Christ within us. That's enough for today. Lord willing, we'll continue next week. In Jesus. Let's give God praise. Holy.